Again, good morning to all. Happy Easter to you. I love, by the way, how the floor shakes when we sing here at this church, which is very appropriate for Easter Sunday. And let me explain why. Begin by going back to Acts chapter 10. So our first reading. Could I urge you, by the way, when you get home, take out your Bibles, Acts chapter 10. It's Peter's speech in the house of Cornelius. We were hearing from that today. He says to him, I'm sure you've heard about the things that happened in Judea and Galilee after the baptism that John preached. You say a well, pretty ordinary observation. Now we'll think for a second. Referring to someone they all knew, John. He was a bit of a religious celebrity of the time. Everyone knew him. Referring to places they all knew. He was giving that speech in Caesarea by the seashore, but everyone knew where Galilee was. Everyone knew where Judea was. What if I were to say to you, you know, right at the beginning of Gavin Newsom's time as governor, I ran into this fellow down in, in L.A., and then later I heard him up in Oxnard, and then Santa Barbara, I actually ran into him. Would you think for a second that I was about to tell you a myth or a legend? No, you'd be expecting me to be telling you a, a real story about something that happened, right? Now, contrast that to once upon a time, or a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> right? If I said that to you, you'd know right away I was trading in mythic language and the language of, of legend and story, right? Now, mind you, I love myths. I love legends. I love stories. They tell us basic general truths about the world, about nature, about ourselves. I love them. They're terrific. I love Star Wars. Those are terrific forms of discourse. But we're not dealing here today with a myth or a legend. We are not trading in grand, abstract, general truths about things. Notice something, please, when you read the New Testament, it doesn't sound like texts from other religious traditions. And again, they're terrific. I have nothing against them. But people who are trading in sort of general abstract truths about the spiritual world? Terrific. There are general abstract truths about the spiritual world. But then read the New Testament. Every page, I mean from Matthew to Revelation, on every page, there is a kind of grab you by the lapels quality. Because these people aren't trading in, in bland abstractions about spiritual things. They want to tell you something that happened. Something happened to them that was so extraordinary. It was so surprising. It knocked them off their feet and then sent them careering around the world to grab everyone they knew by the lapels and tell them about this extraordinary thing. Now, another hint from that little speech, Acts chapter 10. When Peter blithely says, we who ate and drank with him after his resurrection from the dead. Let that sink in a little bit, everybody. We, he's talking about himself and John and James and his friends, who ate and drank with him after his resurrection from the dead. Myth, legend, bland, abstract, spiritual truth, uh-uh. That's somebody who's telling you something that happened to him. And mind you, with the exception of John, every one of those first disciples went to his death defending the truth of it. Doubt me, get on a plane and go to Rome. Walk up the uh, Via della Conciliazione, and you'll see St. Peter's Basilica, right? This great church. You know what that is? That's the most beautiful, elaborate grave marker in the world. Because that building marks the spot where Shimeon bar Yonah, Simon, son of John, whom Jesus gave the name Kephas to, Rocky. Kephas translated into Greek, Petros, into Latin as Petrus, into English as Peter. St. Peter's Basilica. That's where 
that man from Acts 10 who ate and drank with Jesus after the resurrection from the dead, that man who wanted to grab everyone by the lapels and tell them about something that happened, that's where he lies buried. Don't think, everybody, that we're trading in myths and legends here when we talk about the resurrection of Jesus. We're talking about an earthquake that shook the foundations of the world. Let me just take two uh, insights and two lessons from this. Listen to St. Paul when he talks about Jesus. By the way, whom he met most unexpectedly on the road to Damascus, knocked him to the ground, turned him upside down, so that Paul wanted to go everywhere he could and grab everyone he knew by the lapels and tell them the same message, right? Paul refers to Jesus over and over again as the Lord. Now we say, okay, fine, that's nice, you know, spiritual talk, the Lord Jesus. Go back to that time and place. Who was the Lord? Caesar. In fact, if you were greeting someone in Paul's time, in his part of the world, you'd say, Kaiser Curios. Caesar's the Lord. And they'd respond, Kaiser Curios. He's the boss. He's the Lord. He's the one to whom our allegiance is due. Paul, over and over again, in the Roman Empire, said, uh-uh. Jesus Curios. Jesus is Lord. Do the Romans knew what he meant? You bet. That's why Paul spent a lot of his time in jail. Why, finally, he was put to death. How did Paul know that Jesus was Curios and not Caesar? Because Caesar killed him, but God raised him up. Because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, not a bland myth or legend, but something that happened in space and time and in history, because of that resurrection, Paul knew that God's love and mercy are more powerful than anything that's in the world. Yes, even in that awful Roman cross that terrified the whole world, Paul could say, I preach one thing, Christ and him crucified. What a weird thing to say in the first century, by the way. How could he say it? Because God's love has proved more powerful than that, cro than that cross. Do you see the revolutionary quality of the Christian message, everybody? If Jesus is risen from the dead, all the powers of the world that are predicated upon hatred and violence, oppression, exclusion, have been conquered. There's a new Lord. Our job is to announce it. You know what that's called, by the way? That's called evangelization. And we say, oh, isn't that nice? Evangelization. Nice kind of spiritual term. Go back to the first century. Euangelion in Greek. It means good news. You know who sent evangelists around in the ancient world? It was Caesar. If he won a great victory, he would send evangelists who had the euangelion that Caesar has won a great victory. How, how radical these first Christians were when they said, no, 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 no. We're the real evangelists, and we got the real euangelion. It's got nothing to do with Caesar, but everything to do with someone whom Caesar killed, but who God raised up. When you get home, read the first line of the Gospel of Mark, the earliest gospel. He says, I've got the euangelion about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Those are fighting words. In fact, the title he gives Jesus, Wios Tutau in the Greek, Son of the God, that was Caesar's title. Remember when Julius Caesar was put to death and then his adopted son, Octavian Caesar, the Senate called, or they called Caesar a god, and so Octavian became the Wios Tutau, the Son of God. How edgy St. Mark is. How edgy he was to say, no, I got the real euangelion. And it's about the true Son of God, who's not Caesar, but Christ. That's the earthquake, everybody. That's the message that still rocks the world if we let it. I love this quote, by the way. It's from an Anglican bishop from the last century. He said, when Paul preached, there were riots. When I preach, they serve me tea. What he was talking about was what I'm talking about today, is how we've domesticated the message. By the way, by the way, and it may be young people here, college students, university students, when you hear your professors talking about the resurrection as a myth or a legend or one more iteration of the dying and rising God motif, don't you believe it? Because that kind of language is cooked up in faculty lounges. Why? To domesticate the Christian message. You turn it into a bland spiritual statement, who cares? And the tyrants don't tremble. You see what I'm driving at? 
the tyrants don't tremble at that message. But that God raised up the one whom Caesar killed, that's still an edgy, revolutionary message. So be it. So be it. One last insight. Caesar's been conquered, that's true. But a far greater enemy's been conquered on Easter. An enemy that haunts everyone in this room. An enemy that broods over all of us like a dark cloud. I'm talking about death. The powers of the world have been conquered, yes. But even this great power of death itself, which compromises us, reaches deep into our souls and harms us, has now been conquered. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Paul asks. Right, right. Don't domesticate that message either, everybody, because then we don't live in the freedom that God wants us to live in. Easter. Oh, a nice, pleasant little um, religious holiday. If that's all it is, the heck with it. Easter from day one has been a shaking of the foundations. Still is. Let Easter Sunday be the earthquake it was always meant to be.